praise the Lord. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this morning, Lord. We pray, O oh God, that as we open Scripture, uh, your presence will be here. Holy Spirit, O oh God, I pray that you will bring such a joy, such an openness, such a freedom as we dig into your word and as we try to study this together, O oh Lord. Help this not to be a burden. Help this not to be a academic exercise. But, Lord, I pray that this will bring life, O oh Lord. Change us, renew us, edify us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, praise the Lord. I want to take some time this morning uh, because we've been covering a lot of topics uh, over the course of a few months from the book of Acts. Uh, we, we, are, uh, we have covered a lot of topics at, at random, and I just want to spend a little bit of time this morning just bringing it all together and then in the process also share uh, some thoughts that the Lord has put in my heart. Um, so what we're going to start with this morning is, is a, a map, a uh, map of the first missionary journey of Apostle Paul. So if the media team, if you could put that up on the screen. And I will, as, I, as we talk about each of the spots and the places that Paul and Barnabas goes, I will also mention a little bit about what, what, what happened in those different areas. And we will be covering uh, Acts chapter 13 through uh, Acts chapter uh, 14. So, uh, so as we know, the, in, the, in, in um, Antioch, the Antioch in Syria, uh, Paul and a, a few people gathered together. And they were fasting and praying and worshiping Jesus. And what happened? So Holy Spirit says, separate for me, Paul and Barnabas, for my ministry, for my, the work that they have to do. So um, Paul and Barnabas is sent. They uh, go down to Seleucia, and then they go to Cyprus. If you are following the map with me, um, uh, please put that up there as I speak. <clears throat> um, they go down to Cyprus and, and Paphos. And in the Paphos, they go to different synagogues. They are preaching to the Jews primarily. They go to the whole island, uh, and uh, they, that's where they meet Bar Jesus, if you remember that magician. And they meet the pro council, and uh, the pro council comes to the Lord. And that's, this is where John Mark leaves, um, leaves Paul and Barnabas and goes back to Jerusalem. So without John Mark. They go forward. They go uh, north to Perga, which is in Pamphylia. And then from, Pam, from Perga, they go up to Antioch and Pisidia. And in Antioch and Pisidia, we covered that that's where they visit a synagogue and, and they are invited to share an exhortation. And that's where Paul goes in a, a very descriptive sermon regarding a uh, very descriptive sermon ab about the whole gospel. It, it's very similar to Paul's sermon, uh, and uh, we covered a whole message on that. And from there started a major opposition, and, and we talked about jealousy uh, creeping in. Uh, and the, those jealous factions of the Jews, when they saw that, uh, so let me uh, rewind back a bit. The first time that Paul goes to the synagogue, it was just the regular attendance. And they said, hey, come back next Sabbath. And so they come back next Sabbath, and there's now a huge crowd. And seeing the huge crowd, the, the Jews there started to become jealous. And that started a division and a faction that will now taunt Paul and Barnabas for the rest of their journey. So from Antioch, they, you know, dust their feet. You know, they, uh, in protest, Paul and Barnabas says, are, you know, we are now going to go preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, so now they go to Iconium, and in Iconium, they still go back to a synagogue, and some of this may have been mentioned in, in passing as we covered, uh, co covered the series, so some of it might sound new if you especially are not familiar with the book of Acts. And so they go to Iconium, and, you know, they convince some, but at the same time, there's also a, a, a faction against them, because the people in uh, Antioch, Pisidia came over to Iconium to convince them that, uh, that what they, these two people are doing is uh, blasphemy. 
So they come to hear in Iconium that there's a plot uh, coming together to stone Paul and Barnabas and bring harm to them. So they escape Iconium and go down to Lystra. And it's in Lystra, and I think this was mentioned in one of our messages, that a lame man uh, in Lystra was healed by Paul. He was able to see that he had the faith to be healed. And and this is, uh, you have to imagine, this is probably the most non- Jewish area that they have been to. Uh, uh, everywhere else they went to, they, even the Gentiles had a little bit of a Jewish background. They, they either uh, visited uh, um, synagogues or they have some Jewish uh, you know, awareness. But now they're in a very agrarian uh, uh, place where it is all just unbelievers. So seeing this healing take place, the people there who are worshipers of like the, all, the, all kinds of gods, they thought uh, Paul and Barnabas were Zeus and uh, Herm, Hermes. And so they started offering sacrifices t- to them. And seeing this, Paul and Barnabas, they, they tore their clothes. They did not wait to even think, oh, God is honoring us. You know, I think uh, Joe mentioned this last week that, uh, well, you know, this could be an opportunity for them to say, how is God, how much is God honoring us? You know, we preach the gospel, all these miracles happening, and people are coming to honor us. You know, no, that's not how Paul and Barnabas take this. They tore their clothes, and they're, they're persuading them, like, look, we're just people just, just like you. We're just people just like you. Please do not worship us. And so, at the same time, Jews from Antioch come, and Iconium come at the same time. Talk about a bad timing. And they joined those that are there. Um, you know, Paul and Barnabas did the right thing. They did not, they did not claim to be God. They're not, they're not claiming to, uh, you know, establish any kind of deity for themselves or anything. But the Jews in Iconium uh, and, and Pisidia came down and started riling up the, the, the crowd in Lystra. And then, then uh, Paul was taken uh, and, and he stoned. Paul was stoned. Uh, and uh, to the point where they thought he was dead. So he may have lost consciousness or he may have been so injured to, to the extent that, uh, that, he, uh, that he appeared dead to them. So they dragged him out of the city. So there we see something happen. While, um, <clears throat> so while that happens, what, uh, it says in Scripture, and let us turn to that real quick. Acts chapter 14, 20. It says here, but when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derby. Now you can read through that just in passing, but I think there's a deeper meaning here. It is not just the disciples going to him, going to Paul and, and just going there and just checking like this, right? Uh, looks like he's dead. No, what, what the deeper meaning in this is that disciples, there are actually surrounding him in prayer. So when, this is something that for us to also take account to, when, when the ministers of the gospel, and when they, whether they are in a mission field, whether they are here in the United States, whether they are people that we know, when they are persecuted, when they come across physical, uh, physical, uh, de- uh, physical torture, or if they come, uh, come across verbal torture, what does the disciples ought to do? We've been hearing about the, who are the disciples. The disciples ought to gather around these men and women of God who are serving God and surround them. Not, not be spectators thinking, oh, well, that, you know, they, that's what they, you know, they signed up to do, right? That's what they signed up to do. So let's, uh, let's let them, you know, let God handle it. That's not the attitude. It is, it is that they come around and surround the the person or persons that are affected uh, by uh, the persecution. Also, they didn't do another thing. They didn't go about try to find, try to get revenge or retribution against the those who stoned. They went and they they focused on the person who was being affected by the attacks. So we just read that from Lystra, Paul the next morning goes to Derby. And from Derby, they go to Pamphylia, and from Pamphylia, or Perga, they go back to Antioch. So in Antioch, um, 
in, 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 from Antioch onwards. So let's read, read that real quick. So they came back to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the believers, disciples, encouraging them to continue the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed for the elders from every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And so here we see that in a short amount of time, Paul and Barnabas are appointing leaders in each of these churches. And just one thought I just want to leave with each one of us is, how many years have we spent learning the word and growing in the word and being disciples of Jesus Christ? Just imagine that each one of you here, seated here, are infinitely more qualified to lead, and lead churches. How many years have you been in the faith? How many years have you been learning the word of God? Hallelujah. Let that stay with each of you. Let me uh, now flip to uh, the, before the second journey. <clears throat> so let me just uh, skip to uh, Acts chapter 16. There's some things that happen in the middle, but for me to bring the context, I have to skip to 16. Paul came, uh, verse 1 says, Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. And a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And as they went on their way to the cities um, and delivered them for the observance of the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. So here now we, uh, we skipped all of chapter 15, which we'll come back to. This is now talking about the second missionary journey. The second missionary journey, there's a, uh, just quickly show that uh, map if you could. On the second mission journey, there Paul goes back to the, the places that he was persecuted. And come to find out, through the, through the efforts that he made, now think about this, Lystra and Derby. There, there's not a lot that happened at the moment. Lystra and Derby were areas that they came there and all of a sudden everybody started worshiping him and they didn't even have, if you look at the message that Paul spoke, he didn't even get to, get to talk about the gospel, at least from what we know. But we, even without his knowledge, there is a small community there. And look, there's a disciple there named Timothy, a son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And Timothy, at that age, he is about in his late or early teens, or late teens or early 20s. Very young, young man. His mother came to the faith, Eunice. And we know this. Uh, grandmother is Lois. The father and the grandfather is nowhere to be seen. And so what can we learn from this? You know, we often emphasize, we talk about the fathers. We talk about spiritual fathers. We have a very patriarchal um, identity. You know, the Indian identity has at least turned to more of a patriarchal identity. But when we look at the early church, in a lot of times, the early believers were women that came to the faith. The men, and their specific... Uh, you know, counsel that Paul gives in the situation where a, a wife has, is a believer and a husband is not. Because this was a prevalent thing in the church. And there's something that, as a man, I have to look and see, say, what, what, why is that? Why is that? Why is the, even the poor more, uh, more open to the gospel than the rich? All these are connected. That there's something about the attitude and, and the, the humility and the openness that I believe women have, and I'm not a woman, so I don't know, I'm just guessing, that something about men in general, this arrogance and this uh, tendency that I will figure things out on my own, nobody needs to tell me what to do, it's more prevalent in men than in women. And in this case, Eunice raises up her son, and, and so did her mother, Lois. This grandmother-mother team raises up a son, Timothy, in the faith. And we know this, Paul, in, in the 
in the epistle to Timothy, he says um, that the sincere faith that Timothy had came from his mother and grandmother. Timothy talks about how he was a, you know, Timothy was a student of the word from his childhood. Who, who, is the, who are the individuals that propelled and encouraged Timothy to study scripture? It's no one else than his mom and grandmother. So my encouragement to my sisters, older and younger alike, is that don't let anyone tell you that you don't have a place in the church of God. Don't let anyone tell you that you don't have a value in, in God's ministry, that you don't have a calling. You have an equal calling. They're male nor female in the eyes of Christ. All of us are one in Christ. And don't let anyone tell you, don't let anyone tell you that you don't have any partake uh, any participation in the work of the gospel if god god is calling you he's prompting your heart obey his calling pray along with your parents pray along with your church and the lord will open a door for you hallelujah so another thing about timothy here that we got to also notice is that verse 2 of chapter 16 he was well spoken of by the brothers in Lystra and Iconium. I just have a message to our, our younger brothers and sisters. It is important to live out your life in a way that honors God. You may not have a position. You may not have a ministry. You may not have an opportunity to teach and to mentor. But it is important to first live out your faith before God opens any other door. You don't have to force through any door. You don't have to demand opportunities. All you have to do is live out what you know. And as, as you see it here, Timothy in that young age is called a disciple of Christ. We have, a, we have a tendency to delay. There's a delay happening that people are becoming disciples at the age of 25, 26, 27, into 30s. Look at here, Timothy in, in his late teens. It's called a disciple of Christ. He has lived enough to, to be well spoken of. And so, verse 3 says that Paul wanted to, Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And that's verse 3. Without going into too much detail there, this is, you can see here Paul's uh, pr this practical nature here. Because Timothy was half Greek and half Jew, he had to, and, he had, he, and Paul saw that he, Timothy will have opportunities in the future to be a pastor, do a ministry. Paul, Paul has Timothy circumcised. And at the same time, Paul vehemently opposed when Titus was forced to be circumcised because of the Judaizers' teaching that came from Judea. So my time is like absolutely short, so I cannot go into all the details of it. But I want, I want you to uh, just have this in your mind to think about, and this is in verse, uh, Romans 14 as well, the, the issue of conscience. The issue of conscience, and that each one of us have our own way of um, processing convictions. Your conviction needs to be respected. And, and my view of your convictions ought to also ought to be respected. And my, if my conviction is different than yours, then I, not to, I should not flaunt my supposed freedom. Again, I wish I could spend a whole message. That, that, that itself is a message. But I just want to leave it there so we can see here Paul's approach in how what, what he had Timothy do versus what he opposed and what he has continued to oppose. If you look, uh, read the epistle of Galatians and, and on throughout the scriptures, we see in a, a vehement opposed, opposition to circumcision because circumcision was tied to being saved. And that's the major opposition there. And uh, verse 4 it says, As they went on their way to the cities, they delivered them to be... Uh, uh, for observance of decisions that have been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. 
And here, that verse 4, in verse, uh, and chapter 16, it, it covers all of chapter 15. Uh, Minu went, went through it, uh, and so I'm not going to go there. One thing there I just want to point out is, is when uh, James sends a, a letter, and you can see that from Acts chapter 15, 23 through 20, uh, 29, he says in particular in verse 28 in this letter he sends out, For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. And that's important to note that any decision that, that we make, whether it's as a church, as a family, as, as a group of believers, we ought to say with a clear conscience that it, that it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and us. It is not something that we make out of our own, our own intellect, our own logic, but there has to be a level of discernment that when we come together and make decisions for the Lord, that we say it has seemed to be good to the Holy Spirit and us. Last verse, it says, and in verse 16, verse 5, So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. How did they strengthen these churches in the faith, they, they, uh, they were reminding, and the worship team can come forward, they were reminded of the gospel. They were encouraged in the midst of trials to, to come. They were encouraged to, to endure it with joy. They, they, they were helping them examine whether they are in the faith. When the Judaizers and others come and say, well, you're not saved because you're not doing this and this and this. Paul and, and those who are with him strengthen them in the faith by reminding them of the gospel. And then what happens? They were increased in numbers daily. In uh, Acts chapter 14, 27, and I will end with this. When Paul talks about an expansion of his ministry or expansion of opportunities, uh, Acts chapter 14, 27, it describes, he describes it like this. That how he had opened, he meaning God, had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. The door being opened. Sometimes we talk about door being opened in terms of a job or a, um, something, some opportunity in, you know, that is uh, contained to things of this world. But when we talk about a door being opened in Scripture, it's always, it has to do with the expansion of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 16, 9, Paul says this, that a wide door for effective work has been opened to me, and there are many adversaries. When God opens a door in your life for effective ministry, don't think that everything will be you know, full like rose petals and, and without challenges. Along with that open door comes many adversaries. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians that he will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. So my prayer is this. Three things. In Lystra, we saw the disciples having a heart to gather around Paul when he was left for dead, dragged out of the street. And they gathered around and Paul stood up. Let their heart be in our church when there's a hurting member in the church to run to them and to surround them in prayer, to lift them up. Second is Paul finding Timothy. I pray that there will be many Timothys in this church that will rise up from a young age, not waiting till their 30s and 40s or until they're married, but from their early teens on up. And there will be Pauls that come along and mentor these Timothys. Think about the age difference. Paul is in his late 30s, early 40s. Timothy is in his late teens, early 20s. The age gap. And now there's a mentality that only those in 20s can mentor those in their teens. Only those in 30s can mentor those in their 20s. There, there's nothing in Scripture that says that. In fact, I would hope some of our opportunities would step out and see some young people and start mentoring them. I, I pray that the Holy Spirit will, will give a discernment to see somebody and say, you know what, I want to pour my life, my life testimony, what the Lord has taught me. I pray some amachis and aunties will look at some young women in the church and not hold, just stay down to limit it to their families, but look at some young women in church and start mentoring, 
May the Spirit of God enable you to do that. We don't need programs. All we need is the obedience of the Spirit of God to see somebody and say, the Lord is calling me to pour into your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let that be. Last, let's pray for open doors of effective ministry. You know, God has to open the door for us to, to have the gospel spread into our families. God has to open the door to have the gospel spread into our communities. It's to spread in the, uh, you know, whether it's a brick town or whether it's in North India or South India or wherever it is that the Lord uh, places us, we need to understand that unless the Lord opens a door, that ministry cannot be effective. So this ought to be a prayer of ours that the Lord will open some doors. And thank God He has already opened many doors. This is the souls that we have been able to win, whether it's in our own personal life, whether it's as a church, it's all been, it all came about because the Lord opened the door. And that doesn't mean troubles end. That doesn't mean troubles in our ministry will end. That doesn't mean troubles in the church will end. There will always be trouble. It all is part of the packet and parcel. So let us look to the Lord. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this morning, Lord. We humble ourselves, O oh God, and we thank you, O oh God, that you enabled us to meditate from your word. We pray, O oh God, that, that everything that we thought about, Lord, the three things, Lord God, will reign and will, will stay in our hearts. Holy Spirit, I pray that you continue to convict hearts and, and to deal with each one of us, Lord. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.